The real crunch from Colorado's COVID-19 climb could come when limited health care staff and others who are fighting the pandemic are worked to the breaking point. We have broken the high point of hospitalizations, and we are weeks away from good news on that. The governor's idea for a billion-dollar stimulus plan, it's run into a couple of issues, including wolves. A Veterans Day trip out to a small town that's offering an eye-catching honor to our veterans. They also asked if they could share that moment with someone else. And why just thank our veterans today when together we can actually do something to help Colorado's vets and their families as they transition back into life at home. Don't just watch. Let's do something. This is next. Colorado's sustained spike in COVID cases and hospitalizations is creating a new and completely predictable problem. It's staffing. Healthcare workers pushed to the limit. That's going to impact patient care and outcomes. Schools having trouble even just staying open as teachers get exposed and get sick. Even testing sites are running into trouble finding enough healthy people to work them. Take a closer look at that after we show you the numbers. COVID-19 hospitalizations are at their highest point yet in Colorado. 1,169 people, that's up 53 from yesterday. 134 patients were released or transferred over the last 24 hours. And you got to remember with these transfers, it doesn't mean that people are in the clear. They can still be seriously ill and need extensive recovery time. Our latest daily test positivity rate ticked down to 10.4%. Our weekly average is 11.6%. We'll take any movement in the right direction, obviously. Haven't been under 5% considered safe since mid-October. Colorado added 3,352 new cases of COVID-19 yesterday. It's a touch under our weekly average of 3,400 new cases a day. Now, if we can get this number to plateau and fall, then it, several weeks after that point, then hospitalization should do the same. We've seen an increase in the number of daily deaths since October, but no pronounced surge. Our weekly average is now seven deaths per day. An update on the capital fencing project that we told you about last night. So this is supposed to be a secret. Well, till it went up, it wasn't going to be a secret then. But it slipped out at a committee, a committee meeting yesterday. We learned today that it is not yet a done deal to fence up around the people's house following riots outside the Capitol because it still needs approval from a few other committees. You all are this close. Hitting $1.7 million raised for Colorado's nonprofits through your Word of Thanks microgiving campaign. And tonight, we are going to support some life changing, some life saving support for Colorado's veterans and their families. The Word of Thanks that comes to mind when I think of Project Sanctuary is whole. Project Sanctuary knows that whole families serve, so they serve whole families, veterans plus their spouse plus their kids. They help them to heal together from the impacts of PTSD, to transition together back to peaceful life at home. They connect veterans and their families with the resources that they need, short-term and long-term, to succeed after their service. Veterans are 50% more likely to die by suicide than the rest of the population, so healing these families saves lives. And we can help Project Sanctuary do that. If you text the word THANKS to 303-871-1491, I'll send you the link to donate. You can find it wherever you find Next Online. As always, you know the deal. If you're in for $5, I will match the first 50 of those $5 donations. Also, Project Sanctuary was founded up in Grand County. One of the lodges where they have held veterans retreats was lost in the wildfires. This nonprofit continues to push ahead, offering COVID-safe services for veterans and their families in the coming months. This veterans say we've got a chance to do more than just say that we appreciate veteran service. We can show that we appreciate Colorado's veterans and their families. Back to the idea of Colorado's spike in COVID cases and how that is affecting staffing issues in various places. This affects a number of sectors which know that trouble is coming. You're Steve Sager. At Tuesday's Brighton City Council meeting, there was an update on the city's rapid COVID testing site. No surprises here. The demand for tests is exceeding expectations. What was unexpected... The volunteer staff started testing positive. And one Saturday... Three out of five of the staff volunteers tested positive. Positive tests among city employees who volunteered to hand out paperwork and direct traffic. Also revealed at that meeting, 25 people who work for the city have tested positive within the last month. Tri-County Health has identified an outbreak at City Hall. And the state identified an outbreak at the city's police department, too. Over the years, we developed alternate staffing schedules so uh, we can... 
we can handle the shortages. Two positive tests among police staff, eight others are still under investigation. Chief Paul Southard says his department is holding shift briefings outside now to keep officers spaced out. We're suffering through what everyone is suffering through. They are dealing with the next phase of the pandemic, one that will likely leave a lot of workplaces short staffed. Right now we're kind of in a period where our community spread is is changing rapidly and growing pretty rapidly. And that puts our healthcare workforce at risk. Kara Welsh is with the Colorado Hospital Association. She says hospitals aren't immune, even though workers take extra precautions to stay healthy. COVID is in the community now more than ever. They go to the grocery stores, they're picking their kids up at school. They have to be out and about as much as the rest of us. She says 15% of Colorado hospitals expect staffing shortages within the next week. A reminder to wear your mask, keep your distance, and avoid gatherings to make it easier for the folks we depend on. And that is unfortunately where we feel uh, we may see the, the most stress on our system in the next several weeks. For next, I'm Steve Steger. Back in the spring, Colorado sent doctors and nurses to help other areas that were struggling with the virus. The thought was that those other states could then come and help here if needed, but now every state in America is considered a COVID-19 hotspot. So Colorado's state budget is pretty well foobarred because of the pandemic. So the dollars that the state's going to spend next year will be targeted at having the most impact with limited resources. Democratic Governor Jared Polis just presented his plan to the legislature. It's a $1 billion state-funded stimulus package. Politics guy Marshall Zellinger looks at how voters, and to a lesser extent wolves, might have put a dent in those plans. Voters giveth and voters taketh away. Based on the election outcomes, the state's budget will get more money from some areas and fewer dollars from others. To keep it short and sweet, Amendment B, the repeal of Gallagher, and Amendment 77, giving gaming towns permission to increase bet limits, will mean more money for the state. Proposition EE, the tobacco tax, is neutral because that money was already determined where to go. The state will receive less money from Proposition 116, the reduced state income tax, and the state will have less to spend because they're paying more for Proposition 114, reintroduction of wolves, and Proposition 118, paid family and medical leave. The voters made conflicting uh, fiscal decisions at the ballot. They raised taxes in some areas and they decreased them in others. What that ultimately means is that it's roughly a wash. Democratic Senator Dominic Moreno is the chair of the six-member Joint Budget Committee that will meet with the governor tomorrow as he presents his budget plan that includes a state-funded stimulus. This package includes $1.3 billion to support local businesses, put Coloradans back to work, and invest in our state's future. Included in that stimulus, $120 million to provide broadband access to up to 30,000 people in rural areas, $105 million for restaurants, allowing them to keep the 2.9% state sales tax for four months, and $35 million in grants to help child care providers stay open. That leads to a discussion of uh, putting money in reserves versus spending it on stimulus because the next two years, are predicted to be demands greater than revenues. And that takes us to this somewhat confusing graphic. The red line indicates what the state has budgeted for. The yellow line indicates revenue the state took in through September. The green area this year and next year indicates money to spend, like on a stimulus, or save for 2022 and 2023, when that red area shows up indicating expenses we already know we need to cover but can't afford yet. And that's not including the added expenses from what voters approved last week. While President Trump is in a state of denial over the outcome of the election, next viewers ask whether residents of other states, like Colorado, are paying for his legal challenges. And on this day dedicated to veterans, they want to share the praise. When you stop and look at some of them, the stories behind them are unreal. We'll drive up north to a field of honor next. Tonight's next question comes to us from Casa on Twitter. Curious who's paying for President Trump's legal challenges over the election. She asked if campaign donations or taxpayer dollars are being used. So Casa, the Verify team from our parent company Tegna looked into this very issue. The Federal Election Commission does allow campaigns and political party committees to use campaign donations to pay for election lawsuits. So if Trump's campaign has leftover money, they could use that. They could also use money from the Republican Party's legal fund. They cannot use taxpayer money. There's an ethics law prohibition against that. 
There is one side note that we should note, though. In the states where the president is suing, those states may face some cost to defend themselves against the president's team. That money would come from taxpayers in those states. No such challenge in Colorado, so you're good. A little snow on the way for the high country tonight, but not for Denver. Clear? cool and a kind of a quiet evening after temperatures today in the upper 40s and lower 50s. This cooler than average temperature trend will continue for another day as a weak front clips northern Colorado. Now on the northwest flow, we'll see about two to four inches of snow for areas like Steamboat, Craig, Meeker and Maybell, but nothing more than wind along the front range foothills and no moisture for Denver, not for the next 48 to 72 hours. And so in the city for tonight, while the mountains brace for snow, we see the wind subside, skies clear and we drop to 21. Tomorrow with sunshine, highs a little below average in the upper 40s. Warmer Friday, close to 60 Saturday. Little dip in the numbers Sunday, and then we're back close to 70 degrees both Tuesday and Wednesday of next week. The most Colorado thing we saw today is a wall hanging that's moving. Next viewer spotted this in Sedalia. Pretty impressive bull elk head on the flatbed of that truck there. You would need a sizable wall to hang that thing. I mean, you're not putting that in a small house. It's strapped in by the antlers, which is smart. Uh, could you imagine that if that tumbles out of the back of the truck and all of a sudden it starts coming at you down the highway? Uh, if you see something that is just the living embodiment of Colorado or the formerly living embodiment of Colorado, share it with the whole class. Email next at 9news.com or use the hashtag hey next. For a little scoop town like Fort Lupton, it's the only one in Colorado that's doing it. So. A unique Veterans Day celebration in northern Colorado. They see that there's this many people that have done everything for, the, for their country when they're asked to do it. Honoring vets, as well as those serving on a different front line these days. Next. Drive out to Fort Lupton and you'll come across a new display that honors veterans. And you know it's just like those who serve to freely share that spotlight with another group deserving of our appreciation this year, those fighting the pandemic. We go out to Weld County through the lens of our photojournalist Mike Grady. Each flag represents a person. There's a thousand flags out here. A lot of flags. When you stop and look at some of them, the stories behind them are unreal. Uh, my name is Judy Soretto. And I said, we are going to do that in Fort Lupton. My name is John Penfold. I served in the U.S. Army in Vietnam. It's an awesome sight. It's to see that many flags. And everybody, everybody stops and asks, what's going on? Why are you doing this? And we're just saying it's for those who need to be honored for the things that they have done for us. That's right. The field of freedom is to honor all past, present, and serving now veterans, first responders, fire department, frontline workers. It's an honor to them too because they've they've served their country too, just in a different a different branch or a different way than what I got put into. I'm gonna walk back and see the the flag of my buddy that was killed. His name is Gary Thaden. He was killed in Vietnam on July 4th, 1970, about a mile and a half from where I was. And so uh, I have a lot of tough feelings there about that. But uh, how come he got killed and I didn't? I is, uh, you know, it's beyond my thoughts. So. It's, it's a beautiful sight. And uh, it's what it's for. What an honor it is for a community to pay respects the way they're doing it. Those flags will be on display through Saturday. They're guarded day and night by volunteers that work in shifts. And Fort Lupton plans to bring the exhibit back again next year. So we always say that we show our appreciation to veterans. Next viewers tonight are really showing them, making a serious difference in the lives of veterans and their families in Colorado. We invite you to join us. You can do it from the comfort of your couch. Next.
Moment of peace, appreciation, and reflection on Veterans Day. The next few are named Aiden. Just happened to come across the drummer and the bagpiper at the Armed Forces Tribute Garden at Westminster City Park. Aiden sent this our way, said that his father, an Air Force veteran, really appreciated that. Our thanks to everyone who has served our country over the years, those serving still, and to their families, who we know serve alongside them. So we're all showing our appreciation through this week's Word of Thanks microgiving campaign, supporting a nonprofit that is helping Colorado's veterans and their families as they heal together from PTSD. Project Sanctuary has been doing this work in Colorado for more than a decade, connecting veterans' families with support and resources so that they can reintegrate into life at home. If you text the word thanks to 303-871-1491, I'll shoot you that link to donate. You can find it anywhere that you find next online. And of course, I'll, I'll match the first 50 donations of $5. Project Sanctuary, we should mention, is based out of Grand County, Granby. And the wildfires are obviously going to divert some funding sources in that community elsewhere this year. But everybody in Colorado can help make sure that Project Sanctuary is able to keep doing its life-saving work. Working with veterans' whole families so that they can heal together. There are enough of us together that we can make a huge impact for them tonight. In fact, I, I just looked a moment ago, and you have raised $15,000 in about 15 minutes for Project Sanctuary. Something to be very proud of indeed. And Tammy Edwards already wrote in with her thanks for you, saying one of the many reasons to love Colorado, you all are awesome humans. JL uh, tweeted me during the show to say, using FUBARD on Next is the best possible, albeit likely unintentional nod to veterans on this Veterans Day. JL says every military member should know this acronym and its use tonight was masterful. Uh, JL, I'll tell you, it was not unintentional. In fact, when I walked into the boss's office at about 5.30 to say, yo, boss, can I say FUBARD on TV? Uh, I, I told her, I said, well, you know, it's an old Army term. And this is Veterans Day. That seemed to help to make the sale. Uh, Kate did not appreciate this, though. She said uh, she had to look it up on her phone and said, perhaps you could find another word that would suffice. I'm sure there's lots of words that would suffice, Kate, but no other word would more accurately describe the state of our state budget. See you next time.